Greetings, this is Victor. Awaiting the release of the module, let's continue our introduction to the Mi 24P. In case you have not watched part 1, I highly recommend you to check it out as well. In this video I would like to show you around the flight deck and introduce you to the pilots as well as the operator's cockpit. We will also talk about some systems and the capabilities of the helicopter. Let's jump into the rear cockpit. Everything here is really built around the pilot and reminds me a lot of a Soviet Cold War era jet. The visibility is not great for a helicopter, especially on the right side the massive door frame creates a blind spot. But it's quite spacious, with a cargo compartment sitting behind it in the center fuselage there was no reason to make this flight deck any smaller. Left and right of the pilot's seat you'll find an array of circuit breakers, which are all at once activated by big levers. Whenever you plan not to use a specific system during the mission, you'll usually switch the affected CBs back off individually. On the panel right of the pilot, we'll find controls and indications for several systems. The anti-icing system for the rotor blades, engine inlets, the windshields and the ice detector is self-explanatory. The air conditioning and pressurization system is not very complex either. By the way, pressurization on the Mi-24 is not designed for a high altitude flight, but to protect the pilots and passengers from NBC conditions. A slight overpressure is applied to the flight deck and the cabin. Rubber hoses inside the door frames are inflated to seal the doors and additionally special air filters are installed in the air conditioning system. On the same panel we can find the electrical system. In today's standards it appears to be quite complex. It comes with single phase 36 volt and 115 volt, three phase 36 volt and 200 volt AC systems, as well as 27 volt DC. This setup was chosen to accommodate various systems, instruments and devices that were not specifically designed for the Mi24 and require different electrical voltage. But such a setup is very common on Soviet aircraft and once you have made the effort to understand how it works, it will be easier to transit to other types. The Mi8 MTV2 comes with something very similar and even the Tupolev 154 shares some of the components. On the forward and forward right panels we can spot many familiar gauges. Mostly flight and engine instruments that you will recognize from other Soviet types. But you may have noticed a rather sophisticated attitude indicator in the center of the front dash. You'd usually expect that kind of equipment in a passenger jet. Besides an artificial horizon and a bank indication, it can also display flight directors, glide slope and localizer deviation for ILS approaches, as well as drift and radio altimeter indications. But I have to disappoint you. None of these functions are operable in the Mi24P. It's just a nice looking attitude indicator. So when it comes to navigation capability, what you have is a stopwatch, a gyro compass, a Doppler system and good old NDBs. The DIS-15 Doppler system is quite interesting though. It measures speed over ground in lateral and longitudinal axes. The information is then fed to different instruments and the moving map display. Well, kinda moving. You can open the hatch and put a paper chart or scale drawing of your route behind the glass either 2 km or 10 km scale. Then you set up your start point with the adjustment wheels and activate the Doppler system. A small cross will run over the map and indicate your present position. It will become more and more inaccurate during a mission and needs adjustment every now and then. If you're not happy with its performance then of course you can also just use it as a picture frame for your loved one. But seriously, it's a very nice low-tech piece of equipment that can help increase your situational awareness if used correctly. And by the way, this type of moving map was not only used in the Soviet Union, but as well in the West. Here's a picture of a DECA navigation device from a British helicopter. Let's talk about the autopilot, which is situated on the forward left panel. If you can read Russian, you might find the magic words Marshrut, Root, and Visenya, Hover. Now I do have to lower your expectations here, this is still a Soviet helicopter from the 70s. While it will perform an automatic hover for you, within specific limitations, it's not really going to follow a pre-programmed route. Instead, Marshrut simply follows a track that you have selected manually. 
It combines the heading signal from the gyro compass system and drift information from the Doppler system. So when there's a crosswind, it will stay on track. It will fly a more or less straight line until the function is deactivated or until the course is changed manually by the pilot. There is no electronic route and there are no waypoints or anything similar. As you see, the Mi24P comes with rather basic navigation equipment. There are some devices that help the pilot to cope with this task, but a successful combat mission at high speed and low altitude will require thorough preparation and rather high VFR navigating skills by the pilot. Just above the autopilot we'll find indications for the hydraulic systems. The Mi24 has three of them. The main system does most of the work in normal operation. If it fails, the standby system will take over the majority of its functions. The auxiliary system is used to power the landing gear mechanism and some other minor components like the doors of the optical side. The retractable landing gear is great to lower the drag. However, several total losses were reported in Afghanistan because it would not extend fast enough during an emergency landing from low altitude. This was one of the reasons why the Mi-35M received a fixed landing gear. Now the left side panel could be described as a collection of different devices and systems put together in random order. Here we can find controls for fire extinguishers, fuel pumps and valves, signal flares, the oral warning device, voice recorder, IFF transponder, various units to tune radio navigation and communication frequencies and channels, a panel to start the engines and the APU, and many more. You will recognize most of them if you're familiar with Soviet flight decks, especially with the Mi-8. So let's take a look at the combat capability of the Mi-24. What about that ASP-17 aiming sight? Is it any good? Yes, it comes with CCIP aiming, which means that it computes the range of the target and automatically displays the location of impact. While the first Mi-24 production units were equipped with a much simpler aiming sight, where the pilot had to correct for altitude, speed, distance and drift himself, on the Mi-24P this is all done automatically, promising better results. However, the helicopter is not equipped with a laser rangefinder. Instead, the aiming computer, ASVU, receives information from various sources including angular velocity sensors, the radio altimeter and the Doppler system and then geometrically calculates the position of impact. But this means that when you're flying a mission in the mountains, the system might not work very well in automatic mode. Instead, you might have to estimate the distance to the target and make adjustments on the aiming side manually. And by the way, the ASP-17 is not a full-blown head-up display. It will not display altitude, speed or an artificial horizon. It's purely designed for weapons employment. If you want to take a look at its functions already, jump into the Su-25, the non-T version. It has the same device mounted. Moving down to the armament control and weapon selection panel. It's located behind the cyclic and it's somewhat awkward to reach. The pilot can select the weapon, burst length or ripple quantity, distance to target in manual mode and some other settings. The idea is that the pilot will fly, navigate, communicate, manage the helicopter systems and employ unguided weapons. The Mi-24P can carry a wide variety of these. Apart from the gun and grenade pods, different models of unguided rockets can be loaded, ranging from the 55mm caliber S5 up to the massive 240mm caliber S24. And then there is also the fixed 30mm cannon mounted on the starboard side of the fuselage. The operator's primary task is to spot targets, to assist the pilot on his strafe runs and to operate the aiming site for the Sturm and Attacka guided missiles. So let's take a look at the operator's cockpit. It comes with a set of flight controls and some proper flight and navigation instruments on the front dash. On previous versions of the Mi24, these were less sophisticated and placed on the left hand panel. So scanning the instruments while flying from the operator's position was quite inefficient and I imagine you'd get some serious neck pain after a while. Having this equipment on the front dash, in addition to a landing gear switch, means that the operator can take the controls for a while and land the helicopter if that is required. 
From his seat he can also instruct the pilot on how to perform basic flight maneuvers if he's new on type. The operator does not have access to the Doppler navigation system or the autopilot, but he can tune in to an NDB via his dedicated ARC-15M device on the left-hand panel and use that to assist the pilot with navigation. The operator's cockpit also comes with a PKV aiming sight that he can use to fire unguided weapons. It's not as good as the pilot's ASP-17 and it does not come with CCIP. The right side of the flight deck is mostly dedicated to the optical sight and rocket guidance complex Radogasche. There are several panels for testing and operating the equipment. Remember, this is a mostly analog 70s helicopter. The optical sight consists of hundreds of mechanical parts, lenses, mirrors and a gyroscope to stabilize it from vibrations. When not in operation, the optics are protected by two layers of glass and metal doors. Some components require spool up or warm up. There's a blower to remove condensation. In total, the system weights 140 kilograms and does require a lot of care and proper handling. There is no night vision, infrared or TV sight system. And as mentioned earlier, there is no laser range finder. So it's all about the operator using three times or 10 times optical zoom to spot a target estimate the distance, place the mark over it and maintain so until the missile impacts. The guidance system is semi-automatic. An antenna on the port side below the operator's flight deck will send guidance signals to the missile to control its trajectory. It will automatically fly where the operator is pointing the optical side with his control handles. As mentioned, the image he'll get is stabilized against vibrations and angular oscillations. However, it will not stay on target automatically. The operator has to do constant and careful adjustments whenever the helicopter is moving or turning relative to the target. So successfully firing a Sturm missile will require good enough weather and light conditions, good knowledge of the system, teamwork and an operator who is skillful at the controls of his optical sight. The 9K114 Sturm missile has a range of up to 5000 meters and can penetrate up to 60 millimeters of armor. The more modern 9K120 Ataka missile comes with a slightly higher range of about 6000 meters and will penetrate 80 millimeters of armor. Both can be employed against ground targets as well as low and slow flying aircraft. So far we have talked about the equipment on the flight deck to employ unguided weapons and guided anti-tank missiles. What we haven't mentioned so far are bombs, munition dispensers and air-to-air -air missiles. Dropping bombs from a helicopter is dangerous and ineffective. To achieve a good hit, the crew has to overfly the target at a fixed speed and altitude, which makes it an easy target itself. So scenarios for bomb deployment are rather limited. Yet it's possible on most Soviet helicopters and the Mi-24P is no exception. However, there is no dedicated aiming site. Instead, the pilot or operator can use their forward-facing aiming sights in manual mode. A few calculations, careful setup and precise flying are required for a successful bomb drop. Munition dispensers such as the KMGU are used to drop small cargo, anti-personnel or anti-tank mines, as well as cluster munition. However, the KMGU pod is not currently simulated in DCS and not planned for the Mi-24P. That's why we won't go into further detail. Now a more interesting feature of the Mi-24P is the ability to carry the R-60M air-to-air missile. It was designed as a defensive weapon for ground attack aircraft and helicopters. It comes with an infrared seeker, so additional onboard equipment is not required and it's fire and forget can be launched from very close range, 200 meters, and it can reach a target at a distance of up to 4000 meters at sea level. Fun fact, in the Afghanistan war, this missile was used against ground targets that emitted heat, so mostly against vehicles. This is not currently simulated in DCS, but might be in the future. Finally, let's talk about the radar warning and countermeasures. Both systems are very important components for combat survivability. Unfortunately, what we get with the Mi-24P is a very basic RWR, the SPO-10. 
Placed on the front dash in the pilot's flight deck, it will warn you whenever a radar station illuminates or locks onto your helicopter. The device will indicate a rough direction of the source and that's about it. As for countermeasures, the Mi-24P comes with the ASO2V system. It consists of three blocks of flare dispensers on each side of the fuselage. They are grouped together and mounted in a fairing aft of the wings. 96 flares are available on each side. Controls for the system are situated in the operator's cabin, where he can set up the amount of flares, the side and the interval. With a button on the left-hand panel, the pilot can launch the flares. So let's find a conclusion. The Mi-24 was designed in the 60s as a flying infantry fighting vehicle. It was intended to be used in large numbers on the front line of a cold and wet northern European battlefield, carrying eight soldiers and offering them support with rockets, guns and anti-armor missiles. Instead, it was mainly tested on the proving grounds of hot and high Afghanistan and gained further reputation in armed conflicts around the world. Its passengers were moved to the Mi-8 and the 24 became their escort, free to soften up and intimidate any opposition. The Mi-24 is one of the fastest helicopters ever produced. It is rugged and easy to maintain in field conditions. But it's also big and heavy and both the flight controls and the systems require skillful handling. It's not designed to take out targets one by one, hovering at a distance, but to approach the target area fast and low, pop up and use the element of surprise to attack head on and disappear before the enemy has a chance to react. Applying this tactic with the basic navigation and targeting capabilities of the Mi-24 demands weeks or months of training. So the Mi-24P module might not be for everyone. But if you're into learning it and not afraid to read manuals and follow real-world procedures, then flying this helicopter in a DCS mission environment will surely be very satisfying.